觉得我很不敢当。我那个时候正憋着一肚子气呢，都不人，怎么不行啊？我很幸运，一个，我的老伴儿比我年轻好几岁。<笑>一 cremation has taken place with China's father space technology, Qian Xuesen, in Beijing. Qian passed away at the age of 98. He was also the man who pioneered China's space science. He went to the U.S. in 1935 to study, and he returned home in 1955. He was a member of both the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Engineering. Qian was a renowned expert in aerospace rockets and aerodynamics. He spearheaded the research and development leading up to China's first test of the atom bomb in 1964. Other firsts for the country include a man-made satellite in 1970, a transcontinental ballistic missile in 1980, and a manned spacecraft in 2003. For these accomplishments, Qian Xuesen was named a national living treasure. He retired in 1991 but continued his studies, research, and work. A farewell ceremony for the father of space technology in China, Qian Xuesen, was held in Beijing today. The 98-year-old Qian passed away on October 31st. Chinese President Hu Jintao, former President Jiang Zemin, NPC Standing Committee Chairman Wu Bangguo, Premier Wen Jiabao, and other senior officials attended the ceremony. Qian Xuesen helped pioneer China's space science. He went to the U.S. in 1935 to study and returned home in 1955. He was a member of both the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academy of Engineering. Qian Xuesen was a renowned expert in rockets and aerodynamics. He spearheaded the research and development leading up to China's first test of the atom bomb in 1964. Other firsts for the country include a man-made satellite in 1970, a transcontinental ballistic missile in 1980, and a manned spacecraft in 2003. For these accomplishments, Qian Xuesen was named a national living treasure. He retired in 1991 but continued his studies and work. In a 1950s-era building in Beijing, it's the time of day for the two old people to read the newspapers together. They live quietly, seldom talking to each other these days. But little more than half a century ago, they led a life full of peril. Their experiences would make a fine detective story or even a science fiction novel. One day in June 1950, in Washington, Under Secretary of Navy Dan Kimball received a visit that disturbed him greatly. His visitor was a Chinese scientist named Chen Xuesen, and as soon as Chen left his office, Kimball called the Justice Department. "We can't let Chen Xuesen go," he said. "He knows too much. I'd rather shoot him dead than let him leave America. Wherever he goes." He equals five army divisions. What was it about Chen Shishun that made the American government so nervous? How could he be worth five army divisions? Chen Shishun, the man who once made the American government so nervous, is 96 years old now. And rarely appears in the media, but his name is still remembered for the contribution he made to China's aerospace development. Hangtian, this name is he made up. This name, this Hangtian, he made up a lot of brain cells. In the world, let's say that there was no such name in the past. The world was given. 这个宇宙啊，空间呐、啊，这些人比较多。
，后来他就坚持，呃，有航空，再高一层，就能有航天。On August 29, 1950, Chen Shishun. Who'd been working on rocket research in America bought a steamer ticket home to China, but the very next day he was detained by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Los Angeles Customs held a press conference at which they claimed to have found nearly 800 kilograms of classified sketches, notes, and pictures in Chan's luggage. They said that Chan was a red secret agent. So the FBI had taken the decision to detain him. Following Undersecretary of the Navy Kimball's remark about Chan Shishun, the FBI had concocted a plot. Chan Shishun at the time was the right-hand man of Theodore von Karman, the world's leading authority on aeronautics. As one of the four members of America's leading rocket research team, Chan knew a great deal about U.S. defense policy. This was the reason the Americans were reluctant to let him go. The California Institute of Technology, where Chan Shishin worked, arranged his $15,000 bail. But even after his release, his movements were restricted and he was interrogated several times. When he was asked which government he was loyal to, Chan is reported to have stated unequivocally, I'm Chinese, of course, I'm loyal to the Chinese people, to a government that is good for the Chinese people and against any that harms them. On August 1, 1955, the fifth round of the Sino-American ambassadorial level talks was held in Geneva. China and the United States finally reached agreement on the repatriation of each other's citizens. The very next day, Chen Shishun was informed that the restrictions on him had been lifted. Before long, 11 American soldiers taken prisoner during the Korean War were flown to Hawaii. At a conference held at the end of the 1950s, Premier Zhou Enlai remarked that the Sino-American ambassadorial level talks may have failed to produce much in the way of positive results, but they had still been worthwhile because they brought about Chan Shishun's return to China. This photograph taken September 17, 1955 in the port of San Francisco shows the ocean liner SS President Cleveland as it's about to set sail. Among the passengers were Chan Shishun, his wife, their seven-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. For 20 years his only dream had been to make a contribution to his motherland. So he was delighted that his beloved motherland was opening her arms to embrace him. As the Cleveland set off, he closed the American chapter of his life story and headed home. He would never again return to America. Chan 
Chan Shisun's return to China made news headlines around the world. Everyone was curious about how this world-famous rocket expert would live in red China. A reporter from the Hong Kong newspaper Takan Pao took a picture of the Chan family walking from Hong Kong across the Lohu Bridge to Shenzhen. The photograph shows Chan Shisun holding his seven-year-old son by one hand and a guitar in the other hand. The return of the world-famous rocket expert Chen Shisen didn't go unnoticed by the CPC and China's national leaders. Before long, Chen was received by Chairman Mao. Although Chen was probably unaware of it at the time, his return had prompted the adoption of a policy to develop missiles. Life for Chan Shisun was very different back in China. For 20 years, he'd worn a business suit, but now he dressed in a Sun Yat-sen style suit. He looked no different from any other middle-aged intellectual. However, his knowledge and experience set him apart, and he was appointed head of the Institute of Mechanics under the Chinese Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Ah Chen was keen to familiarize himself with the situation in China as quickly as possible. So on the leader's advice, he visited the more developed industrial cities in the northeast. That visit would prove important both for Chen Shisen and for China's missile development. <laughs> That short meeting was to the young rocket expert a pleasant interlude during his visit to northeast China, but it would produce far-reaching results. On February 17, 1956, a proposal arrived on Premier Zhao Enlai's desk. It was from Chen Shisun, and it concerned the founding of China's own aerospace industry. It included a long-term plan for developing missiles. In October of the same year, Chen set up the Fifth Research Institute under the Ministry of National Defense. It was China's first rocket research institute, and Chen Shisun as one of only a handful of rocket experts in China at the time, was its first president. As early as 1949, Chen had worked on the concept of the rocket-powered passenger plane. During the 1950s and 60s, the U.S. developed the Delta Wing aircraft. The precursor of the space shuttle, it was based on Chen's design. The aircraft was called the Dragon, and so Chen Shisun became popularly known as the father of the dragon. However, missile development in China at the time was still to get off the ground. Chen Shisun was responsible for translating numerous missile-related texts. And he also took up teaching again, 
as he had done at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He taught first-year students basic missile technology. Being taught by this great scientist who was back from America, his students were impressed not only by his knowledge but also by his humility. They especially enjoyed the frequent seminars he organized. Chan Shisun encouraged a habit of discussion among the young students. They learned to voice their thoughts on any issue they faced, to listen to various opinions, and finally to decide on the solution themselves. In the autumn of 1957, when Chen was still teaching his students the basics of missile technology, the Soviet Union successfully launched the world's first nuclear-capable intercontinental missile. A month later, the world's first artificial satellite was launched. These successes marked a victory for the socialist countries in the East and inspired the Chinese people. With assistance from the Soviet Union, China began its own missile development. However, in the 1960s, just as missile development was entering the crucial stage in China, the Soviet leader Khrushchev ordered the withdrawal of all Soviet experts from China. Deprived of the Soviet expertise and blueprints, China's State Council decided that the country should rely on its own experts to develop high-end missile technology.航天事业的发展当时在发展过程中总有两种思想一种思想呢感觉是很难能不能办成很难说就是对自己信心不足吧另外一种呢就想着把这个步子感觉办得太慢这个世界上已经发展到这样的情况了我们为什么好像这么一
Only three months later, more exciting news came, this time from deep inside the northwestern desert. China had successfully carried out its first atomic explosion. Chan was now given the highly challenging task of combining the rocket with the bomb to create China's own nuclear-capable missile. The CPC and China's national leaders showed a keen interest in the project. Chen knew he had to succeed. A single mistake would be fatal, since it would damage the prestige of his motherland. Never before had a Chinese scientist had to bear such pressure. For a hundred days without a break, Chen Shishen worked at his research base. October 27, 1966. A thunderclap in the Asian sky announced the successful testing of China's first nuclear-capable missile. The foreign media described the explosion at Lapneur as so powerful that it shook the whole world. And the whole world marveled at China's rapid progress. In 1970, China successfully launched its first satellite, the Donfang Hong-1. As it passed over Beijing, the whole capital fell quiet as thousands of people listened to the tune, The East is Red, coming from the satellite. The satellite was the latest of Chan Shishen's great contributions to China's aerospace industry. The successful development of the two bombs and one satellite laid a solid foundation for China's manned space flight program. In the meantime, China's team of space scientists had been growing in strength. Later, in the 1970s, Chan Shishen came up with a bold proposal. On November 20th, 1999, the Shengzhou One spaceship was successfully launched. Several days later, Wang Yongzhi visited Chen Shishen's home with a gift. The model would become Chen's most prized gift. Today, the model is still on the bookshelf opposite Chen's bed, where the old scientist can see it every day. In 1991, Chen Shishen was awarded the title Scientist Who Has Made an Outstanding Contribution. He is the only scientist in China to have received the honor. But Chen himself insisted that all the credit should go to the CPC and the Chinese people. He believed that he had just happened to return to his motherland and had just done what he could. Even though at age 80, he still believed there was a lot of work for him to do. In his latter years, whenever he's wanted to be quiet and think, Chen Shishen has listened to the Four Symphonies by Brahms. Some things, such as life and death, are changeless. All we can do is make the greatest contribution possible. In his work, Establishing Systematology, published in 2002, Chen Shishen reveals that his research is aimed at 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China.
On September the 17th, 1955, at the port of Los Angeles in the United States, the ocean liner SS President Cleveland was about to set sail. On board was the world-famous rocket scientist Chan Shisun and his family. The photograph shows the people who came to see Chan off. The man with his back to the camera is an FBI agent who is preventing people from approaching Chan Shusen. Chan himself had already been informed that in order to guarantee his personal safety, he should remain out of sight throughout the entire voyage. He had already spent five years being investigated by the U.S. authorities. Chan had always kept smiling in the face of adversity. He told reporters he was very happy to be going back to China. Despite his return being delayed by U.S. authorities, he was still determined to do whatever he could to contribute to his motherland and help his fellow Chinese lead a better and more dignified life. In 1979, a U.S. government delegation visited China. A Defense Department official who was a member of the delegation inquired about Chen Xuxin, who had been his teacher at the California Institute of Technology. While pioneering America's rocket research, Chen had also been a teacher of jet and rocket dynamics. But in 1955, he'd vanished from the United States and lost contact with many of his American friends. The official, during his visit, discovered that his former teacher was now a pivotal figure in the rapid development of China's aerospace technology. This very ordinary building dates from the 1950s. At the end of 2003, two remarkable people met there. That meeting would be a milestone in the development of China's space industry. The two men were Chen Shisun and Yang Liwei. One, the founder of China's space industry, who was in his 90s. The other, an astronaut in the prime of life. Both names are celebrated in the history of China's space industry. In 1991, Chan had been the focus of considerable attention when he had been awarded the title Scientist Who Made an Outstanding Contribution. It was the highest honor China could give to a scientist. But Chan's reaction was rather unexpected. The first time Chen Shisun had been really excited was in 1955 when he'd finally been granted permission to return to China. Before he left, he took his recently published book, Engineering Cybernetics, to his mentor, the world-famous aeronautic scientist Theodor von Karman. After reading the book, von Karman told Chen, Now, you've surpassed me academically. Yingwa when the two men said goodbye in 1955, von Karman, who was 74 at the time, presented Chen with a picture of himself. Von Karman was very sad to see his student go, and on the back of the picture he wrote, See you soon, in German. However, that wish would never come true. 
Even so, as Chan's teacher, von Karman would no doubt have felt gratified at the success of Chan's book, Engineering Cybernetics. the strange thing about this classic work, which would have such a huge impact on the academic world and the field of engineering control, was that it was written during the five years when Qian was under investigation by the American government. 人家硬的我感觉是那样的情况 In the past 50 years, Chan Shusen has been invited to visit America on numerous occasions, but he has always declined. He's even refused to accept a number of titles, including that of member of the American National Academy of Engineering and the American National Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Top Science and Technology Award, awarded by the United States President. His view was that if the American government didn't offer a public apology for its unfair treatment of him, he wouldn't accept any honor from it. Soon after his return from America, Chen Shisun was put in charge of the development of missiles and rockets. He was answerable directly to Premier Zhou Enlai and Marshal Nguyen Jun. His contact with the CPC's first generation of leaders convinced him that Marxism and Mao Zedong's theories of practice and contradiction accorded with his 20 years of research experience abroad. He felt that Marxism could serve as a guide and an impetus for scientific research. Meanwhile, the communist goal of serving the people wholeheartedly broadened his mind. In 1957, Chen was admitted to the Communist Party of China. When as the head of the Fifth Institute under the Ministry of National Defense, Chen always impressed people with his friendliness and modesty. He liked to be called Comrade, which he deemed as the supreme title. He also used Comrade whenever he greeted or wrote to other people. In the 1960s, Chen led a frugal existence, just like millions of ordinary Chinese people. At the same time, he handed two large sums of money over to the party. One was the payment he'd received as the author of the Chinese version of Engineering Cybernetics. The other was a large inheritance from his father. In the 1990s, Chen made two further donations. One was the one million Hong Kong dollar He Liang and He Li Fund Award, and the other was the one million Hong Kong dollar Hua Ying Dong Fund Award, which he put towards desert control work in western China. People who didn't know Chen 
found it hard to understand his actions.这就是十月份讲话了。五月份他的人民日报上看到王王仁仲写了一篇文章，说中共中央组织部把史莱赫与雷锋、焦雨露、王进喜这个和钱学森同时定位在广大群众中享有很高威望的优秀共产党员，所